I say I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm disabled, I live in New Jersey. And the idea is Palestinian came first for a very distinct reason. Because I have all my minority star statuses, being Palestinian is the most controversial. My life didn't change post-October 7. Palestinians were discriminated against in Hollywood my entire career. I have been watching massacres and people getting their asses kicked or people getting beat to a pulp yeah. while praying at the Church of Nativity, while praying at Al-Aqsa Mosque, while praying in the streets. Like the only thing that changed post October 7th was I realized that my fellow comedians and a lot of the people I worked with in entertainment would like kill me if they could. Welcome to the Africa podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on the series, we have Maysoon Zayed, who is an internationally acclaimed uh, actress and comedian who is from America, from Palestine, from the world. Maysoon, thank you so much. Did you just say I'm from America? I'm not from America. I'm a Palestinian who's displaced and occupying the indigenous lands of the Lenny Lenape of New Jersey. But yes, I live here because I can't live there. I try all the time, but they send me away after three months. <laughs> Hi, softball. Mikey. Are you ready for me? I'm ready. That was a softball and you hit it like out of the park. Let's do it. I'm not no, going to pay attention to any of your questions. I'm just going to talk about whatever I want to talk about because I feel like I owe it to the Arab women of the world to just be like, down with the patriarchy. And I'm starting with your podcast. I think that's, that's, I'm the first patriarch that needs to be taken down. So I appreciate that. I, I'm just using you as like a practice, like a soft test case for tearing down patriarchy. Yeah, I am usually, I am the dress rehearsal. <laughs> okay, Mason, I have a question for you. Okay. When did people first start calling you a comedian? I became a comic like almost immediately. Like, here's what happened. I, since the age of five, I wanted to be on a soap opera, like a musalsal in America. And I went to school and I majored in theater at college. And then I graduated and I auditioned. And I realized that Hollywood shunned disabled people, but they also shunned brown people. And they were really crazy about fluffy people because I am not bone skinny. Um, and I looked around to see people who looked like me and succeeded in entertainment. And I saw a comedian whose name was Richard Pryor. So I went to this place in New York City called Caroline. I took a class and then I kid you not, my third show, I was a professional comedian. I got it. Like I just got what the art was. I had watched a lot of comedy growing up and like when I got on stage, it was really easy for me to pick it up. So I was, it wasn't like being a writer. Like I had to have a best-selling memoir on the New York Times bestsellers, and people were like, well, it's still one book. Like, I had to get to, like, three books before they called me a writer. I was a comic the first time I was paid, and I was paid in my third show. It's funny, because, like, the, 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 like, recurring joke is if you take a class in stand-up comedy, you'll never be a, um, a professional comic, but you are the rare exception to that rule. Oh, I don't believe that rule at all. I think that stand-up comedy is like piano and like tap dancing and that you absolutely need to take classes and you need to learn how to write and you need to learn delivery and you need to find your voice. And I teach stand-up comedy. Like I offer stand-up comedy coaching on my website, maysoon.com. I've taught stand-up comedy in Palestine. I've taught it in Abu Dhabi. I taught it in... Uh, Princeton University, which is an Ivy League college in the United States. So, like, I believe that stand-up comedy must be taught. But I believe it goes hand-in-hand hand with experience. So, like, I teach my students how to write jokes, how to perform, how to make their joke better when it fails, how to kill a joke that will never succeed. But I also, you know, I don't just tell them. I put them on stage all the time. Like, 
you have to go to open mics and you have to try your jokes in front of live audiences. And in the new, you know, COVID world, Zoom is a great place to have like a test open mic with a bunch of other comics and just try stuff out. You don't even have to go to the clubs anymore. It makes it really universal. But I, I absolutely believe that stand-up comedy can be taught and that it's a really good idea to take a class if you have any interest. And you Amazing. can take one for me. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, when, when Trump got elected, I remember like a lot of people were saying, I was switched were saying to Trump from sit. That was quick. My, I have like whiplash. I feel like I should have put gel on my brows. Anyway, continue. They look great. They look happening. great. Um, this idea basically, when, because I remember when he first got elected, there was this idea of like, how can we be, how can we be funny about these awful moments, this awful time? right no um i get i don't know mikey i don't know what comics you're hanging out with right but like i'm palestinian my whole life has been awful like i've just been like watching massacre after tragedy after like bombing my entire life so like trump sliding into office was not as like traumatic or hard to make fun of like in fact he was such an outlandish character it was boring making fun of him but, because he himself yeah. was broke. My question isn't about Trump. My question is, insofar as you're a Palestinian living in America, how does it feel to work on your art form and work in and around comedy since October 7th? We're, you know, we're recording this January 30th, uh, 2024. How does it feel to do what you're doing um, doesn't feel any different than October 6th when 33 Palestinian children had already been killed uh, in 2023. So October 7th, which I condemn the killing of civilians by anyone at any time, regardless of who kills civilians, what reason they killed them. I condemn the killing of civilians by anyone at any time. I also am not a fan of kidnapping. However, I do know the difference between a soldier and a civilian, and I do know the difference between a hostage and a prisoner of war. So let's put those things aside. I've never been a fan of Hamas. I've hated Hamas my entire life because I don't like theocracy, Afikra. I don't like any leadership that uses religion. I believe religion and government should be completely separate. So I've never been a fan of anyone that involves any sort of patriarchy religion misinterpretation of religion but again my life didn't change post october 7. palestinians were discriminated against in hollywood my entire career i have been watching massacres and people getting their asses kicked or let's if in case we have to be clean people getting beat to a pulp yeah. while praying at the church in the TV, while praying at Al-Aqsa Mosque, while praying in the streets. Like, all of these things are very regular to me. So the only thing that changed post-October 7th was I realized that my fellow comedians and a lot of the people I worked with in entertainment would, like, kill me if they could. And that, like, they really didn't consider Palestinians human. But, like, I've always faced a ton of discrimination and a ton of racism. It just became more violent and more overt, but I've been I've been experiencing this since 2001 since post 9/11. Yeah. Do you remember do you have vivid memories of being in the entertainment industry post 9/11 and sort of like the Freedom Fries Freedom Fries America and how that may be different? I'm born and raised in the great state of New Jersey. I spent my entire summers growing up in Palestine, but I'm born in New Jersey, which means I'm literally right across the river from the Twin Towers. So like I grew up seeing those towers. I was there, I watched live as they fell. And like, I was part of the terror attack. Like I was part of the people who were smelling the smoke, who were looking for their friends who were in New York City laying in the middle of Times Square because there were no vehicles and like part of that trauma. And so that shift to Arab Americans being public enemy number one and the conflation of Muslim and Arab and the 
idea that they had no idea that you can be Arab and Christian and Muslim and South Asian or Muslim and white. And uh, I have such vivid memories because that's where my career started. That's where the New York Arab American Comedy Festival that me and Dean Obidala, my partner in comedy crime, founded together. And we did it as a reaction to the negative images of Arabs and Muslims in media. Like prior to 9-11, we were the gods of comedy. Stop a la la like Danny Thomas and <clears throat> Vic Tabak and Jamie Farr and Marlo Thomas. These were the people that were like the godfathers of comedy. And suddenly in media, we were being vilified and, you know, reduced to, I always said, if you were a guy, you were a taxi driver or a terrorist. And if you were a woman, you were either in a burqa or belly dancing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to go back to those early days of Arab American comedy. And by early days, I don't mean Danny Thomas and Marla Thomas. What I mean is the sort and of post 9-11. Yeah, in your career. Yeah. Um, the sort of axis of evil comedy tour and what you guys were working on. Um, Ahmed, at the same Ahmed time. had me kicked off the axis of evil comedy tour because he couldn't follow me. I got more laughs and that was the reason I was like removed. So it really? started Haj Rabrani, Aaron and Ahmed. And then they brought in Dean and I as guests. And then we were in San Francisco. I'll never forget this. And I slayed. I basically got a standing ovation. And Ahmed, Ahmed went after me and he just blew it. He barely got a giggle. And he walked off stage and he looked at me and he said, they only laugh at you because you're a legless beggar. And then he had me removed from the tour. And shortly after that, the guys got the Comedy Central special. And there were no women in the special, which I thought was horrendous and a terrible yeah. way to represent um, Arabs and Muslims in media after everything that Dean and I had fought for. But I love Dean and Maz and Aaron, and they're so funny. And I was like so happy that they got to make this legendary special. But yeah, that's the origin story of how I was briefly part of the Axis of Evil and then unceremoniously removed right before the Comedy Central special. But the stuff that you were doing in New York, too. In 2010, yeah. in 2010, we did our own Live Nation tour, which was me, Dean, and Aaron, and we did Arabs Gone Wild, which was so much more fun than Axis of Evil because Axis of Evil was, like, apologetic and, like, love me, and Arabs Gone Wild was, like, screw you. We deserve everything that you have you're a bunch of bigots, and if you don't want to party with us, we don't care. You're missing out. <laughs> did you get any, I mean, like, did you get enormous amounts of pushback the way maybe some people would imagine, or was there, was industry being like, all right, we get it? Pushback from who? Audience members at, you know, no, comedy my audience clubs. Loves me. My audience loves me. Yeah. I do the four C's. I do comedy clubs, colleges, corporate, and conferences, and I can do it all. Throw yeah. me in front of like a bunch of 90-year-olds, uh, senior citizens, building, I'm slaying. Put me, you know, in a fifth grade class to like hustle my comic book for Scholastic, I can do it. Like audiences love me. The industry absolutely unequivocally hates me. I am a confident woman who is completely unapologetic and publicly Palestinian. I sell out thousand seat theaters and I have never ever gotten a Netflix comedy special, an Amazon comedy special, Comedy Central, Arabia special. I've nowhere to be found. Every uh, male comic I ever trained, the ones that I met when they were 16 and 17, all have comedy specials, all have shows. I don't. Why is that? Because of the pushback. The pushback against the fact that I don't fit into the stereotype of what they think a scary Arab is. And comedy is anti-women. And Hollywood is anti-disability. And the world is anti-Palestinian. We're literally being killed by the thousands while people stream it. So like there was this really famous saying, the revolution will be televised. I keep saying the genocide will be live streamed. And that's yeah. what's happening. So the pushback I've gotten from the industry is just 
they've completely frozen me out of the spaces that I should be in. But I managed to get in anyway, just with sheer will of how I've run my comedy career. So the comedy career led to a TED Talk. TED Talk went viral. I ended up getting the role on the soap opera that I always dreamed of on General Hospital. But like I said, none of my shows have made it past pilot. I joke when I teach that I have sold seven shows and none of them have made it to air. And it's always like right before I'm supposed to get to air, people are like, your politics of wanting equality for all is just so offensive. Like we can't put you on this major network when you don't think any baby should be murdered. Like it's just too much the way that you yeah. think disabled people deserve rights and shouldn't be killed, do you know? So we just can't have you. And it's literally that they think I'm so original and so exotic. And then when they get to that corporate finish line, they're like, I don't know. She seems like she likes equality a little too much. We just, we can't take a risk like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm dead so serious. Yeah. The thing that disturbs them the most about me is that, the equality thing. They're like, can you please just say like that one group of people should get killed? Just that one group. And I'm like, nah, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you feel like right. you're, the audience has widened? Um, I'm, I'm very curious about like this moment compared to this sort of early 2000s. And if yeah, people so are beginning to understand. Yeah. The internet wasn't a thing, first of all, right? Yeah. So like we would do shows in New York and we would like give out postcards on like the corner and we would like, call people on their landlines and we would hang up posters in like the hookah lounges. And like, that's how we advertise. And like, I even said to you right now that the virtual world is a huge stage for us in comedy now. So the way that my comedy world expanded is like this. Starts out in New York with Dino Vidala. And then I'm going back and forth to Palestine and people are like, hey, how do you make money? You wear a lot of gold. And I'm like, oh, I'm a comedian. I tell jokes and people pay me. And they're like, no way. And I'm like, yeah, way. And so I did my first stand-up comedy show in Arabic in Amman, Jordan. In like Jordan, imagine, imagine like the least hit place to, to debut. Um, in 2002, and people mm. had no idea what stand-up comedy was. They knew what parody was. They knew what doing characters was. They knew funny poems, but they had never seen someone stand up on stage and talk about their personal life. And so I pioneered stand-up comedy in the Arab world. And I first, I did books in Amman. Then I did Dot and Nedwe in Bethlehem, like a couple of seconds later. And then like three months later, I did Shakespeare in Beirut, a place called Shakespeare. So then I just started doing it. And like, as I was doing it, people were like, yeah, I want to do that. And then YouTube was like moving and people were starting to watch stand up comedy and the access of the evil was kind of leaking through and they started doing like Dubai and the big like Emirate kind of market. And that's how it expanded. 2014, I did this TED talk and I had no idea TED talks were a big deal because they didn't pay me and I'm a mercenary. I only do stuff that pays me. And so I didn't know it was a big deal. It gets translated into 47 languages and I get the shock of a lifetime. And that's, yeah. I'm a privileged disabled person who had no idea that the rest of the disabled world was being abused and killed by their parents that 50% of all Americans killed by police officers were disabled, that we were more likely to be assaulted in our lifetimes, that we weren't getting education, we weren't getting healthcare. So that whole world of what I call the disco, disability community, disco, opened up to me only in 2014. It's only yeah. been a decade that I've been a global disability advocate. I always advocated 
for disabled and wounded children in Palestine. It was like my pet project, trying to mainstream them into schools and, you know, get them playgrounds and shoes and all that good jazz. But to become who I really became, which was an intersectional advocate for people who are just discriminated against and abused worldwide, which starts with women and kind of goes down from there. That happened in 2014. Yeah. And then I think the COVID world really just cracked open a whole new level for me because I remember doing those first virtual shows and being like, oh, how am I doing this without hearing an audience laugh? This is so wild. And now it's like when the audience laughs, it's like, I'm like, shush, I'm trying to have a show here. You're trying to mute Why? them. Because I've gotten so used to like the virtual platform. I love how accessible it is, like how easy it is to have like ASL interpreters and like you don't have to worry about the bathroom being accessible because the people watching are at home. And so it, it's been really fun to kind of dabble in the hybrid virtual world. Yeah. I want to go back to the TED Talk. So I got 99 problems. Palsy is just one. Um, that moment. Or that, maybe I should say that set, because you probably just uh, approached it like a set. Yeah, how it was similar, just a set. <laughs> how similar was that to how you would be on stage like earlier that year? That was corporate. That was not comedy club. So comedy club, I would have been cursing up a storm. I would have been screaming about politics. I would have been a lot, lot more me. Yeah. And the TED Talk was like, hi, everybody. This is me. If I'm G-rated and on PBS on a Sunday morning, yeah. I'm going to talk to you about bigotry and supremacy, and I'm going to wrap it up in a really cute comedy bow, because that's what the TED Talk is about. The TED Talk is actually about discrimination. It's about hate. It's about exclusion. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's beautifully done because it's, it's basically saying, you see me. When you see me, you see palsy, but you have no idea all this other stuff. You don't see right. um, all these other facets of my life that are an indication for what it looks like to be a Palestinian, what it looks Mikey, like to be- what was the first thing I listed? In that- uh, In, in that the list of all the minority- I don't remember. Statuses, I'm Palestinian. Yeah. I say I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm disabled, and I live in New Jersey. And the, the idea is Palestinian came first for a very distinct reason, because I have all my minority stat statuses, being Palestinian is the most controversial. People hate and fear disability, but they don't as outwardly state that they fear and hate disability. They'll say things like, oh, you're so brave, I'd kill myself if I were you. But when I tell people I'm Palestinian, they're like, no, don't say that about yourself. Yeah, yeah. I had a, I had a representation that dropped me in October, and she was like, I need you to stop being publicly Palestinian. And I was like, okay, so both of my parents and all four of my grandparents are Palestinian. I can trace myself back to the 1600s. And she's like, you could be American. And she was right. I could. And we've seen people who look like me decide to just be American and be really successful and not be controversial. But like, you know me, Mikey. I can't do that. Yeah. You didn't even let the intro slide. No, I don't let nothing <laughs> slide. It's like when an Arab person calls me Ajnabiya, I'm like, excuse me? And if Translate so, that. Um, when that when that came out, you said you were surprised that it had so much traction. Um, no, no, no. I wasn't surprised at all that it had so much traction. I mean, I but absolutely... you said you were like, I didn't know it was that I big a deal. Even that platform, it would go viral. I was surprised at the condition of the disabled people in the world hmm. because I had grown up with such extreme privilege that I had no idea that the rest of the world was being like, trafficked and abused and denied health care and all the horrifying things that the disability community faces. And when you add to that refugee status, 
and like what it means to be disabled by a refugee, which intersects very hard with um, being an Arab and being a yep. Muslim in the world today. That's also a fascinating horror show. What, I, I admittedly do not know much about what it is like to be somebody who lives with cerebral palsy in the Arab world. Um, do you have, could the you Arab possibly- world is much yeah. better than the American world, right? So let's just be real. The Arab world has a huge problem. The number one cause of disability with all the famine and all the war and all the strife in the Arab world is what? Cousin love. It's cousins marrying cousins. That causes disability. So the good news is most of the Arab world has built itself out in a really accessible way because like the monarchs and their kids are disabled. So when you go to the richer Arab countries, the accessibility is incredible and it's universally designed and it's built in from the beginning. When you go to Qatar, which built itself in 12 years for the World Cup, Qatar also built with universal design. They were so smart. They built everything accessible from square one. You don't see that here in America. They built a library in Queens like two years ago. The whole thing was completely stairs. And we walked in and we were like, where's where's the elevator? And they were like, no, it's like a glass staircase bookshelf. And we were like, you built something in 2023 that was completely inaccessible. So I don't see that. But there's something else happening in the Arab world. People who are wounded are treated as heroes. People who are born disabled are often treated as throwaways. They're often not given education. They're often you know, left to stare at walls, given menial tasks, not treated as equals in the family, hidden away from society because if society sees that you have a disabled child, they might not marry from your family. This is the same type of thing you see worldwide when you lack education. So this is not exclusive to the Arab world. You see disabled people being treated the same way in the poor parts of Africa, in the poor parts of South Asia, in the poor parts of South America, and in the poor parts of North America. So what I've seen and how I grew up was Palestinians were really good to the disabled. We were Karim. We were very generous, charitable people. So I saw disabled people being helped, given wheelchairs, um, treated as equals. Uh, you know, I had a cousin named Nasser. He had Down syndrome. He sat and ate with us. I went to all the weddings. I was mainstreamed into school. My dad fought for me. We were treated as equals. So I hung out with more disabled people in Palestine, and I saw them revered and treated as equals more in Palestine. But again, it seems that my experience was very foreign. That yeah. wasn't what most people with disabilities, especially visible disabilities, especially girls and women, experienced. So I was very privileged. I don't. I don't know that. I don't think that that's a a a super mm -hmm. common experience. Um, and I'm curious about like this is probably not for this conversation. Um, maybe it is, but um, about sort of like the public health um, recommendations to actually improve uh, the way sort of the public health systems deal with um, <laughs> avoiding these types of uh, glass staircases and stuff that's a lot more, um, uh, you know, detrimental yeah, to I mean, that. I guess, like, first of all, we start with public health and not like the Arab world has to stop marrying cousins. This is just ridiculous, right? And if you're, like, madly in love with their cousin, get genetic testing don't cause disabilities willingly, right? So there's no shame in disability, totally fine to have a disability. Um, in my case, my cerebral palsy was caused by a lack of oxygen at birth. The doctor who delivered me was drunk. I lost oxygen. I have a disability. There's no shame in it. I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, which means sometimes I use a wheelchair, sometimes I don't. And it's not because I'm faking it or it's because I'm lazy. It's because it depends on the situation. So I think step one, stop causing disability. But step two, 
universally build everything as accessible, right, Mikey? And that means at the really like nuclear level. So if you're planning a birthday party, plan it in a place that a wheelchair can be in there. Don't like assume like nobody's gonna break their leg. None of your friends are wheelchair users. Person can have a stroke and 10 days later, they're wheelchair users. You can exclude them from your party because you thought, no, all my friends can run upstairs. That's how you start on a nuclear level to be like, I'm going to make my life accessible. I'm going to make my life open so that people can tell me that they have an invisible disability like chronic pain and they can't walk up those stairs. And I don't know it because it doesn't show on them but inside their joints are inflamed and they can't move. Or I'm going to make it accessible so that my coworker can call in on a Zoom and not turn on their camera. And I'm not going to assume that they're being lazy and they want to wear their pajama pants. I can be like, hey, maybe they have an invisible disability like depression or anxiety. And they can come on to the Zoom vocally, but they just can't do what it takes to put on a dress with an upside down cat today. Right. So yeah. instead of assuming the worst out of everyone, let's make life easier and more accessible for everyone. Everyone's going to have that day where the staircase is just too high. So if we eliminate it, we make it easy for everyone, including the moms. And like moms are big spenders. Like if you don't care about disabled people, care about the moms. They like quiet rooms. They like ramps. They like all the things that disabled people like. So if it's not for us, do it for the big spending moms. Did I answer the public health question? Yeah, you did it. You nailed the landing. It was perfect. Um, I have uh, a question about how you think your comedy has evolved. Um, my comedy? Yeah. Oh my I'm God, it's evolved so much, dude. Yeah, like how? Well, first of all, when I was young, I was imitating other comics. Who? So, like, I was dirty. I was haram, harami, haram, 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 haram. And I used slurs, and I used misogyny, and I was just a terrible person in general because I was watching people like Andrew Dice Clay and Eddie Murphy, and I was like, yeah, I got to be a misogynist to be a comedian. Who I am now as a comedian, I think is really fun in that it's totally just me. I'm a really funny person. I don't plan anything. I get on stage and I just have a conversation. It's like when you call your best friend and you haven't talked to her in a month and you're like, this one's my turn because you got to hear what just happened. And you sit on the phone with your friend and you're like, half hour conversation about all the ills of the world and all the terrible shit that happened and how you won and whatever you did. That's how I approach my comedy. I'm just having a conversation with you all. And like, I think that people either want to be my best friend or they're terrified of me. But either way, I'm like a car crash. They can't look away. But like, I would lie to you if I told you I plan anything. I have a show called Funny Puppet. It's my favorite one to sell. And it's one hour where I let the audience just throw out suggestions and I improvise all the jokes. And it's like, what's better than that? I literally plan nothing, nothing. I am the audience do all the work. And they're like, doll. I'm like, dolls are terrifying. They murder people, but you don't know because only the dolls are the witness. So, you know, I, my show is me. It's, it's lie. It's the last bastion of free speech. I have no fear. Nobody controls me. I guess that's why I don't have a TV show because I can't be controlled. I perform for Kings. I perform for presents. I perform for Muhammad Ali. And I've never once bowed my head down for anyone. My job is to make people laugh, not to educate them. The fact that they get educated by my mere presence is a reflection of them, not me. Mm, it's a bar. Um, <laughs> That's a bar. I want to talk about your book, the the most recent. The so okay, it's a graphic so novel. I need tell us, Yeah, tell us what a little is bit. A graphic novel. What like what's the real name for a graphic novel? A picture book. It's a comic <laughs> book. It's a comic book. So if you grew up loving comic books, you're gonna love Shiny Misfits. Okay. So 
This is Shiny Misfits, my book. It's shinymisfits.com. First of all, it's a comic book. So if you love comic books, you'll love Shiny Misfits. If you don't love comic books, this is a great way to get into comic books. Um, it's written for like fifth and sixth grade, like 10 to 12 year olds, but I wrote it for everyone. And like, there's so many jokes in there for the parents. And one of the things that makes me most proud about Cheyenne Misfits, which you can learn about at CheyenneMisfits.com. My illustrator, Shadia Amin, is also a woman. She's also Palestinian. She's Palestinian, Lebanese, and Colombian. So like, mm -hmm. she's a firecracker. And like, the two of us together are just like, BIPOC women in stereo and she has a bunch of invisible disabilities I have a bunch of visible disabilities and we're just like yay and the book was such a fun collaboration it's a love letter to my parents but it's not autobiographical so the mom and dad are drawn to look like my parents but they're named after my best friends so the dad is Dean after Dean Obidala and the mom is Melak, after the woman who made these earrings that I'm wearing. And so the book centers uh, a brown girl named Bayan, and uh, she has cerebral palsy, and her name is Bayan because Bayan means revelation. And I just love that as a name for a girl. And I always say if I had a daughter, I'd name her Bayan, but God gave me cats instead, so I, I named my character Bayan. <laughs> and book, I, I wanted to do two things, and one is probably going to upset people, but um, I destroyed all the borders. So there's no borders in my books. There's no countries, nobody's Arab, Latino, South Asian, Phoenician, none of it. Um, so what we did was we went back to the elements and the, the, the natural world that the First Nations use. And so when we did the audio version of the book, because... The book, the print version is scholastic. Everybody has to buy it. It's so, so beautiful. And then the audio version is audible on Amazon. And it was really important to have the audio version come sure. out on the same day as the print version, because that's how you make it accessible to blind kids, to English as a second language kids, to kids with, you know, with um, intellectual disabilities. It's really helpful for a lot of people. So when we um, described the skin tones, because it was important for me to have that range of skin tones, right? So kids could see themselves in the book. We used elements like my skin is like rose gold. My mom is opal. My dad is like mahogany and so on and so forth. So we used like, you know, metals and elements and wood and sand and all these beautiful things. And it was just so fun to take that out of the world. The second thing that I wanted to do was destroy this trope of the disabled kid. When you look at disabled kids throughout like any literature that we have of kids lit, the friend is always like told to be the friend of the sick kid or like bribed yeah. to be the friend of the disabled kid. For sure. Or is the friend because they're a sibling and they have to be. Well, this character, again, she's cool. People want to be her friend. They're not her friend because she's disabled. They're her friend because she's Bayan. And Bayan is a character and she's funny and she's fiery and she makes bad decisions and she's really fun to be around. And the book, I wanted to teach kids like two things because it is a middle grade book. And one was like, how do you deal with friendship falling apart, right? We yeah. talk so much about relationships and divorce and breaking up and heartbreak, but we don't talk about like when you have that fight with your best friend and all of a sudden like three years has passed by and you're like, where did my best friend go? And how did that fight happen? And why has this happened? And so the book, I have like a real good heart in there of like, don't lose your best friend. Say sorry, figure it out. But also... I wanted imperfect parents because I do a joke on stage about how my American friends always say, your mother will love you no matter what. And I'm like, she can barely stand me right now. She will not love me no matter what. Like if I got knocked up right now after I'm divorced and like not married, my mother will kick me down a flight of stairs. Like she will physically assault me. And she's not an abusive woman, but like 
I wanted to write our moms, like the mom that always nags you, the mom that doesn't take off of work to go to your dance recital because it's not that big of a deal, even if the other moms say that it is. And I wanted to have that character that had the parent that wasn't the extreme. What we see in kids lit and even in, in adult literature is the parents are either perfect or they're monsters. And I was like, what about the one that's doing the bare minimum, but totally keeping you alive? And like, if you're in a car accident, they're running to the hospital, but otherwise they're not really running because you're fine. <laughs> like, you know, I want yeah. that parent because I want kids to be, the book is called Shiny Misfits. And the theme is you can fit in or you can stand out. Someone like me is never going to fit in. So have fun standing out. But the book is also for the parents, right? So I have all these jokes for like our age group, which would be the parents of the kids that I'm writing for. And the idea is I want parents to appreciate and celebrate the disabled kid they have yeah. instead of pining and dreaming about the perfect kid they'll never have. And Bayan happens to be disabled, but her friend Davy has a mohawk and her friend Michelle is poor. And like, there's so many kids that can see themselves in this book. And I say, even the popular perfect kid, they're gonna see themselves in this book too, because that is its own misfit. Being perfect is not easy. It is a really hard thing to maintain, especially as a child. And we have that in the book too, that like incredible, perfect attendance, perfect grades, perfect hair standard that we yeah. put on children and how unattainable and damaging that is. How long had this idea been sort of bouncing around your head before you actually got the words I'm on the paper? I'm a lifelong comic book fan. I grew up loving comics, especially an Iraqi comic that's probably not written by Iraqis. It's probably written by white men and I'm going to be embarrassed, but it's called Pride. It was about the lions in the zoo of Baghdad. It's it's a comic book that just stole my heart. But I, I was a comic book fan growing up. And Shiny Misfits itself, the idea, only came to me when Scholastic said, do you want to write a middle grade book? And I was like, no, I want to write a comic book, which you call a graphic novel. And they said, okay, what's your idea? And my immediate idea was, I would not exist today as the person in front of you if the internet existed when I was a child. Because the reason I'm a performer, fearless, love the stage, never get nervous, is my parents couldn't afford physical therapy, so they sent me a tap class. And they couldn't afford occupational therapy, so they sent me to piano. And I was always getting standing ovations and I didn't realize I was the inspirational disabled kid because nobody was videotaping me. I wasn't going viral. I wasn't being exploited for hits. I didn't have parents that were making a living off of a GoFundMe to get me that super duper wheelchair that they think I need that I don't want. And, and they weren't even showing up to the dance recitals. <laughs> and like, you know, my dad was and he had a giant yeah. like camcorder on his back he really so cute. did my, my dad was the can can guy his mantra is you can do it yes you can can he was at every dance recital every so piano recital but if i had known that people were only clapping for me because i was the inspirational disabled kid i would have quit first year i would have holed up in my house i would have played video games i would have never left i didn't know i thought i was fantastic i thought i was getting standing O's because I was talented and that gave me the confidence to actually become really good in my craft. So by the time I got on stage to do stand up, everyone else was vomiting in the back room. And I was like, that's entertainment. Like, you know, it didn't even <laughs> phase me or scare me. So I wanted to write the book that would have destroyed me to say to people, what you're doing with kids online is really dangerous. And the fact that our lives are online and that our worth is online is really, really dangerous. So yeah. read this book, appreciate your kid, um, 
be okay with being a misfit, whether it's disability, whether it's, you know, who you love, whether it's what your skin tone is. And buy my book at shinymisfits.com because I'm so sorry. My computer is literally low battery. Your Mac will sleep soon unless plugged into a power outlet. And my plug is nowhere near me. So this it's okay. is goodbye. I want to ask one last question before we, before we, I think I we have, think like, gets, I answered. Before I, think we'll be, I think we'll be okay. I know that message. It, you'll have a few more minutes. Here's the last question. Somebody watching this or watching other things that you've put out would think to themselves, Maysoon is supremely confident. This, this woman does not have like, yeah, she does not have an ounce of self-esteem issues or confidence or just, or lack of confidence. How do you maintain this? Is this just, you know, God given? Dad. It came from my dad. And if you didn't have a dad, like, let me be that person for you, right? My dad just taught me to like, hold my head high, to accept who I was, to not walk in limp, literally limp in shame, to not be desperate for boys' attention, which I think was really, really big for me. Like. I see a lot of women who allow men to tear them down and to define their confidence. And I was one of four girls, so we were raised as men and we walked through the world confident, fearless, and ready to fail. And we understood that failure was totally fine and that you either learn from the failure or you move on from the failure, right? So. My memoir is called Find Another Dream. And the, the kernel of knowledge is if your dream turns into a nightmare, find another dream. One of the keys to confidence is not being afraid to fail. But one of the keys to not being afraid to fail is knowing that you're not going to kill anyone. So like if my joke fails, I try again the next day. If your heart surgery fails and you kill someone, that's a whole different ball game. So don't be confident when you could fail and your failure will kill someone. Be confident when the risks that you take can do no harm, but bring you closer to the dream, who you are, what you want to be. That's what my confidence is. My confidence isn't I'm perfect or I'm the funniest comedian on stage. Sammy Abed is the funniest Arab comic right now. It pains me. I want it to be a woman. I want it to be me. It's Sammy Abed right now. Um, but confidence is not about perfection. Confidence yeah. is about going into the world and being able to say, I'm going to give it my best try. I'm going to do no harm. And if this goes south, I'm going to survive. Yeah. That's beautifully said. It's funny that you bring up Sammy because I feel like looking at his stuff online, he's starting to talk about the fact that he's Palestinian so much more, at least in terms of the stuff that he's publishing online. Um, when you see more and more Arab comics start talking about their politics, um, are you like, it's about damn time or, or are you happy? Like, even though comedians don't yeah. buy everything they do viral or yeah. like everything we do online, I think if you look at live my stuff, you wouldn't realize how much I talk about Beyonce, which is like at least the fifth of every comedy routine. And Sammy's been talking about being Palestinian, being Buddhist, being Sammy his entire career. This dude one time did a thousand shows in a row. He talked a lot about it. But um, what I'm seeing is we've, we've been fighting this fight for a really long time. We're finally getting the amplification that we need. And I think that some of us can do nothing but put Palestinian stuff on because anything else seems just obscene when you have thousands and thousands of children being killed when we're still like 200 people a day slaughtered you know when i just got back from Palestine, i was in Palestine for christmas because who doesn't go to the place where jesus was born for christmas especially when they're muslim and palestinian so i went and when i, I spent time in the hospital ward and when you see what's happening there you're like Everything I make is going to scream Palestine because right now it's not okay to talk about anything else, but give all the creators a break, all the musicians, all the comedians. We have an algorithm to compete with. 
So when we're posting on social media, we do sometimes have to put the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey video, because if we don't, Instagram's going to shut us down. Yeah. So like, give us a break. We really don't want to be talking about, you know, the latest Qatar Palestine game, but we have to in order to get into into that loop. Yeah. Uh, Maysoon, I told you that I'd let you go. Maysoon.com, shinymisfits.com, fight the good fight, stop the genocide. If it's still going on when this podcast is published, Mikey has completely failed. I put it 100% on him. And uh, yeah, buy my merch. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Maysoon, thanks so much. Lots of love to you. Thanks for doing this. I need to find a plug before my next meeting. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.